right. We've got 23 people here now, so I think we'll start and anyone who comes in can, uh, can join us as they go. Uh, thank you to everyone who is coming to our uh, session this week, our workshop on News Reporting 101. Um, my name is Laura Howells. Uh, I'm a journalist currently in Whitehorse, but usually based in Toronto. Um, I am joined by my colleague Isabel Sternthal. Uh, there. Uh, we are the co-directors of the Canadian News Journalism Project, where we uh, try to be a network um, and a resource hub for um, high school journalists and people who are interested in, in media making at a high school level. Um, we have our, our website, we, we host uh, where we have resources, we try to connect student papers um, with opportunities and with each other and with resources. And we have been hosting uh, online sessions since the pandemic started. And uh, we're really pleased to be doing a session today on news reporting um, with two wonderful uh, journalists, Valerie Dittrich and Maddie Wong, uh, who I'm going to briefly interrupt before I uh, interrupt, sorry, I meant introduce before I hand over the reins to them. Uh, Valerie um, is a recent graduate of Ryerson University's journalism program and a former news editor at the Eye Opener. Her work mainly focuses on health, security, breaking news reporting, and she is currently a freelance journalist um, who has two cats, who as she mentioned you might hear in the background. Um, and Maddie Wong um, has been dedicating herself to covering campus news and student politics during her time as the news editor at the Eye Opener, which is the independent campus newspaper at Ryerson University. Uh, she is passionate about covering news, local communities, and social justice, and has written and created digital content for Shameless Magazine, News Decoder, and RU Student Life. Um, and she is currently finishing her final year at the journalism program at Ryerson and is the online editor for the Eye Opener. So we're really pleased to have both Maddie and Valerie leading our session today. Uh, the session will be about one hour long. And uh, please feel free at any, uh, well, I should mention that this session will be recorded because we're hoping to post it online afterwards for other people uh, to use or that you can go back and, and uh, reflect on. So just keep that in mind. If you have any issues or, you know, any concerns with that, let me know. Send me a, link, uh, a note in the chat or email our email. Um, otherwise, we will be recording. This is an interactive session. There's going to be interactive elements. Um, we want it, you know, we're a fairly small group. There's only like 25 of us here. Uh, so, you know, feel free to break in, ask questions, ask questions either with your voice or in the chat if you feel more comfortable. Um, we want this to kind of be a, you know, it's not just like a lecture, it's a, a collaborative session where, we, you know, second best thing to all actually being in a room together. So with that, I am going to hand over the reins to Valerie and Maddie. Um, take it away. Uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Valerie, like Laura, Laura said. Um, and uh, welcome to our new session, How to News Basics. <laughs> oh, hello. I'm Maddie. Um, um, I'm super excited for this. I was actually working with a high school newspaper. I think everyone here is from like a high school paper, or so somewhat in that same thing. So I totally understand where you are. Um, sorry, but I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> No, no, no. And if you haven't worked at a paper, I didn't work at a high school paper before. I went to journalism school, like we didn't have one. So if you're here just to learn how to write the news, then great. I love, I love this. <laughs> All right. So I guess we will get started. So I think the first thing we need to kind of establish is uh, what is even a news story? I think this is probably the first question that a lot of new journalists ask themselves. Um, because, you know, you read the news every day. You read stuff about um, there was a collision at this intersection. There was um, or even like coronavirus stuff like today, Ontario reported X amount of cases. Today, the state of California report X amount of cases. Like you see stuff all the time. But like, I think nailing down what constitutes something as news is probably the hardest thing to start with, especially when you're new. Because, well, things are happening, so does that mean it's news? No. <laughs> so the one thing we were told very early in journalism school, and I want to drill this into your heads, is just because an event is happening, it does not mean the event is news. Your headline and your lead cannot be an event happened. <laughs> Because we know the event happened, but what did something happen at the event that was significant? What is significant about that event? It can't just be um, all 
give you an example, like a, a new story out of ours wouldn't be students go to Frosh Week. Yes, students went to Frosh Week, but why? Patty, if you want to continue. Oh, sorry, the next slide or this one? Oh, just if you want to keep going on it. This slide. You're, you're sharing the screen. Okay, <laughs> okay. No, okay. No, I meant like, um, so as I was saying, news can be anything from a current or ongoing event, an issue students are facing, or, you know, in your case, a hiring of a new staff or a teacher. So as, as a reporter, some things you need to ask yourself, if you're covering an event, or if you're trying to figure out if something is newsworthy, would your audience find it interesting? And is it relevant and timely? Um, we'll kind of be going loosely over audiences, a bit of a more later thing, but just trying to figure out what makes a certain thing news is probably the most difficult part. So like I said, for you guys, it wouldn't be just because your school track and field event happened doesn't mean that it's news. Did something happen at the event? Did somebody who is someone going on to, um, I guess like national competition, that kind of thing. Okay, yes. Um, sorry, I realized that you meant for me to jump into <laughs> to like what a news story was, but I would get into okay. that right now. Um, yeah, sorry guys, this Zoom training is like super strange to me sometimes. Anyway, so Val and I actually worked together at the Eye Opener, which is the student paper at Ryerson University. Um, so we were both news editors at the time and we covered everything from current events, um, any issues that revolved around students. We held our student union accountable, which is basically the equivalent of like a student council at high school. Um, we also kept um, university admin accountable for any initiatives or any promises they made to students in Ryerson communities. Um, we kept up with all things student life, communities in and around campus, just if anything was happening, odds are Val and I had to be on it. So these are just a couple of examples of the things that we did that might inspire you folks. Um, to look with things around your area, no matter where you're from, and hopefully spark some potential pitches and story ideas for you. So uh, the first one here is an RU pass canceled for the upcoming school year. Uh, the RU pass was basically like a transit pass that was implemented into the tuition for Ryerson. Um, and it was kind of like mixed emotions for both students, but it ended up getting canceled. Um, so anything revolving around transit that students use every single day, that we reported on. Um, you can also see that there is a student strike. This is against um, cuts to OSAP, which if you're not from Toronto, it's basically um, university financial aid um, for folks who needed to pay tuition um, and just other things like cool people coming to campus. We had one of our uh, can Canadian, I guess, like political leaders come to campus and he was talking to students about um, federal loans. Um, and then, like I said, again, we also kept um, our student union accountable. So there was a story in the bottom right corner that we did, and apparently they weren't working their full hours. So we got this huge track sheet of all their clock in and clock out times, and we kind of broke that down. And we we're like, oh, you're getting paid X amount of money per year, but yet you're not working your full hours. So those are some of the stories we've done. The Eyepreneur, which was the paper um, that we work at, or I currently also still work at, um, has found a lot of news over the past, I don't know, couple of years that it's been running. I think it's been running since like 1967 or something. Um, but yeah, so in the next slide. Yes, so in this slide, um, these are just general eye-opener examples of things that we've done as well. Um, sorry, not we've done, but like just our paper and our peers and our colleagues. Um, so things like monitoring the prices um, in the menu around, around campus, um, finding out that vegan burgers <laughs> weren't actually vegan. Um, one of our colleagues in the um, bottom left story actually couldn't find any stories that were happening. I guess it was just kind of like a slow week. So what she actually did was she decided to order like one of those lab science kits off Amazon, I believe, and she just decided to see how <laughs> how dirty our campus was. So she went around with like little Q-tips and started swabbing like the handrails and all of, like the surface levels that like students touch on a daily basis, which sounds really gross now, now that we're in a pandemic, but <laughs> that's basically what she did. Um, and that actually turned out to a story as well. So um, hopefully from these examples, you guys can 
kind of see what we um, were looking for, things that we reported on, and hopefully can kind of inspire you guys to um, hopefully write about something similar or come up with pitches like these in the future at your papers. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to plug stories they've done already in the chat or whatever, um, and we can kind of see like what you folks have already been reporting on your high school papers. Um, but just to throw some other ideas at you guys, um, you could also report on things like, I don't know, like your school banning phones on campus. I know that was a big thing in Ontario. Um, when I was reporting at my high school paper, I reported on things like a new vice principal or a new staff member. Um, you could guys even do how sports teams are practicing during the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you guys already do this. You could cover your student councils. Um, I did that a couple of times when I was in high school. Um, and if you're ever just like in search of ideas, um, a really good place that we found stories was just online. So on social media, seeing what people are talking about, um, what kind of issues are affecting other students in other provinces or other countries, and how could that also be used in a story from your city or wherever you folks are from as well. Um, but yeah, Val can take it away now. Yeah, so I think like I said in the beginning, um, you know, you have your story, you understand what it's gonna be about, and you're like, great, I can't wait to get started. But where do I start? <laughs> I have this issue all the time too. Like I'll have a, like I'll have an idea and I'll be like, great, don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, so especially for you guys, I think something a really first step would be to meet students where they are. Um, where are they posting about stuff on social media? Do you follow people when you're great or from your school on Instagram? Are they posting stuff on their stories of like in the school being like, like I know in, all the time in my high school, uh, if something was like gross on campus, people would post on the story and being like, like I went to Holy Cross, so I'll use my school name. They'd be like, oh, Holy Cross cannot get more gross. Like they would do stuff like that. Like where are they posting? Like for us, um, a lot of students post on Reddit. There's a whole Ryerson subreddit. I'm not sure how common that is for high schools, but you know, check people's Twitter's account. Like even like people's personal accounts will tweet something, like not even thinking about it. It's something about the school being like, oh, this happened or so-and-so said this, like not gossip stuff, but like genuine um, issues. People will just tweet about it, not think about it. Um, don't be afraid to drop by your student clubs or unions. Uh, keep track of what initiatives are putting on. Um, like Maddie said, I highly recommend you guys kind of take a look at your student uh, government and your union. It's a kind of a university thing, but I feel like, like student government is a very, interesting topic and to get that in high school as well to get that experience is really valuable um you know keep track of what people are doing talk to your friends and they're in a few clubs maybe just be like hey like what are you guys up to anything cool happening like you know like just kind of get conversation started and start talking to people from different ends of the school you don't really know um because you can get a lot of stuff there's always um an underserved part of a school or a community and getting to that is a really really valuable thing to report on um, if you read a story from a media outlet um, and feel like you can turn to a student angle, that's a story. Um, I think a good example for us was I did a story back in January of 2019, I think, about the OSAP cuts. Um, and like I said, OSAP is, stands for Ontario Student Assistance Program for kids in Ontario to get loans from the government to go to school. And we did a story about Ryerson students reacting to that. Um, and I made sure to interview people who would be very, very affected by the OSAP cuts and some of the people who wouldn't be affected by the OSAP cuts. Sorry, I think my internet took me two seconds. There we go. Um, another way you can do it is if you read a story like right now with COVID, like if you read a story that this is a very hypothetical example, but let's say the high school down the street has a COVID outbreak. Um, you can always put together a story being like, um, this, what, this is what would happen if XYZ school had a COVID outbreak, like your school. And you could put together a whole story about, are they prepared? Like asking people like, what kind of plans do you have in action? Um, learn who's who in the school, who has access to this information to be willing to share it with you. Yeah, get, like, kind of the same thing. Get to know people who know people. <laughs> it's kind of a bad way of saying it, but um, it's very, very helpful to get to know people that kind of know what's going on that other students wouldn't not trying to be like shady like don't go sneaking in the teacher's lounge or the vice principal's office don't do that <laughs> um 
or like try to get someone to like get information for you that can potentially get them suspended. Don't do that, but try to learn who's who. Um, get to know the administration a bit better, especially if the administration trusts you. That's a big, big uh, step as well because people need more to tell you stuff. And again, taking a look if it's even news. That's the first thing you got to make sure. Is it news? Great. And then you can start on everything else. Okay, researching. This part is sometimes when, uh, for me personally, when I'm doing stories, is the part that I go, oh, I have a great idea. And I look it up and I'm like, crap, there, someone already did it. <laughs> and that happens a lot. It happens a lot more than you think it, it does. So don't get bogged down if you think you have this amazing idea and then you Google it and it's the first hit on Google. Don't worry, it happens to me constantly. <laughs> um, so the first thing is see if the story has been done before. So if you're like looking up an idea, especially if your paper has covered it, um, make sure they haven't covered that exact thing because then it's a bit redundant to do it again, especially if it wasn't that many years ago. Um, you'd be essentially writing the same story, which is kind of no point in doing that. However, if it is a similar story, but there's a fresh angle you can take on it, totally go for it. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. We've done a ton of stories where it was kind of done before, but we had a new angle on it. Um, an example I can think of, I think there was a story in the eye opener years before I did it about, um, what was it about? I think it was about um, different kind of curriculums inside of uh, more creative programs. And it was just kind of a general story talking about what their curriculum looked like. And when I had an idea of asking people if they thought their creative program was stifling their own personal creativity when it was supposed to do the opposite, I remember looking it up being like, oh crap, they already did that. But the different angle was that they just kind of looked at the programs as it was. The angle I took was, do you think that, did you think going into a creative program would allow you to express yourself or do you feel like the um, academia side of it is kind of oppressing that? So that was kind of a new approach I took to it rather than just kind of rehashing the same story. Um, find out whose voice would be most useful, who is important, who is relevant. If you're doing a story on, like I said, if you're doing a story on um, a tentative thing, if your school had a COVID outbreak, who is the most useful to talk to? Would you talk to the principal? Would you talk to the vice principal? Would you talk to the board? Is there a health and safety group on campus? Is there any kind of teachers that would be involved in the process? Could you talk to the janitors about, do you have to up your cleaning processes? That kind of thing. Just thinking about logically who would be able to add to this story and give me the information that I think that I need. I'm gonna let Maddie take this one because it is her story and she did a really good job with this and I kind of want her to go through um, all the research she did for it. <laughs> oh, yay. Um, yeah, so to piggyback off of what Val was saying, um, a lot of the stories that I found, um, I found it very beneficial just to look around what was being done, specifically in our university community. So local centers, um, individual researchers, so profs, um, students who are doing um, I guess like their final year's project, any entrepreneurs or, you know, a bunch, a lot of students often have some really cool side hustles. So those are stories in itself. Um, this story that I had done specifically um, isn't about a student. It's actually about um, a prof in a research center at Ryerson. Um, and actually how I found this story, which is might be a good tip for you guys if you haven't done this yet. Um, so I was looking at the university site and researching through different research centers and projects. Um, I creeped a bunch of profs just to see what they were up to, what they were working on. Um, and I found this one super interesting and I decided to reach out to the specific prof to learn more. Um, and the research process, I mean, like I am like by no means an expert about water solutions. I'm not a science journalist. I dropped math and science in grade 11. So my knowledge was really bad. So I really did have to research and read all of these external articles and made sure that I asked this person like the right questions. Um, so I searched up the impacts of climate change and how water is a factor of that. I searched up um, the history of how indigenous communities across Canada have always just had a very like inconsistent like amount of clean water on the reserves for various reasons. Um, so I just searched up all these causes and I also wanted to know why this project was important, how our university was taking um, a role in helping to alleviate these issues. 
Um, so to break down the science, I talked to the prof um, over the phone. He was super cool. Um, but I noticed that a lot of the things he was saying was very technical. It was a lot of scientific jargon. So um, it can be intimidating sometimes, especially because profs and researchers are so confident in their work and they know everything back to back because it's just what they've been studying for like whatever, like a year or so. So I really had to be like, sir, like, honestly, like, you know this, but my readers don't and I won't. So I need you to kind of break it down and baby like certain steps and certain words for me. Um, and that super helped and <laughs> our entire masthead also found it really helpful um, because, you know, if you don't have the certain knowledge, especially when it comes to science and all the jargons and um, crazy terms, it's super helpful to break it down. Um, and you can also do that with linked external research if you decide to hyperlink it for online or attribute it um, or even find other people to talk to, maybe even students that can help explain it a little better. Um, but yeah, if you're unfamiliar with any topic or have an entrance, um, in anything. Research it beforehand. Um, oftentimes you'll have questions about it and those are questions that you can actually use um, to reach out and for a source and ask about it for your story. Um, and my last tip, so I don't know what kind of um, issues you folks are reporting on, but if you're looking for experts for certain issues and you feel that you kind of just need like a professional or industry um, or someone who's in the field to really just be that backup voice for what you're trying to do for your story. Um, I found a lot of universities have these portals where you can literally look for an expert in any field. So Ryerson's, for example, the link's down there. Um, you guys can look at it afterwards. But if you type in any subject that you're working on, such as food, all of these profs will pop up and they actually sign up to be listed for media contact for reasons like journalists um, who want to write about all these different topics. So they know they're on the list. They know they're willing to talk. Um, and I know you guys are from a bunch, a bunch of different areas, but it might be kind of worth it to see if your local um, universities or colleges have something like this, um, just in case you're reaching out to someone and you don't really know where to start. Um, and I know you folks are in high school, but I definitely encourage you to reach out to external sources. Most of the time, they're super willing to talk and can be super friendly and helpful. Um, and student journalism is still journalism, and I'll talk about that a bit more, but don't be afraid. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Yeah, just to quickly take you back off of that, I have rarely ever had like a bad experience with somebody when I said I was a student journalist. Usually I find sometimes they're even more helpful because like the like, oh, they're a student and don't let the title of like being young deter you from like going for hard stories, which we'll get into, but yes. <laughs> yes, okay. So once you've done your research, once you kind of figured out who you wanna to talk to, um, reaching out to a source is just important because you wanna land those interviews and you wanna get this story done and published. Um, so whether it be over the email, you wanna to talk to them over the phone or in person um, or even on Zoom now, uh, you should always let your source know a couple of things. One, who you are, just kind of quickly identify yourself. Um, you know, like I'm a fourth year journalism student, that's my title, um, or you know, like I'm a student journalist at my high school paper, very quickly, very brief. Um, you want to tell them the intention of your story. What are you writing on? Why do you think that they're the best person um, to speak on the story that you're working on? Why are you reaching out to them? Uh, where is it being published? Um, you know, will they be able to see it afterwards when it's published? Um, the deadline especially is important. Um, if people are super busy, you just want to say, hey, like if you have time in between now and X deadline, um, it'd be super great to hop on a really quick, like 10, 15 minute phone call with you or um, meet over Zoom or whatever it may be. Um, if there's a PR person, like if it's from a company and you have to go through like a PR spokesperson or any kind of media agent, you should also include this info to them as well. And always ask if you can help clear anything up or answer, answer any other cues. And most of the time they will help you set up the interview with that person. Um, and other things to let them know when you land the actual interview is that one, their responses will be recorded. Um, so whether you are recording it on your phone or on your laptop and you are um, working on the story later on, um, 
definitely important to tell them that they're being recorded. Um, not that it's going to get published on the internet for like the entire world to listen to your conversation, but just because you want to make sure that whatever they're saying is being reported and written accurately um, and as efficiently as possible. And also for just fact checking reasons, um, depending on how your newsrooms work when it comes to the editing process. Um, other things, they cannot see a draft prior to publication. Um, they can't really see your questions beforehand. Um, I know this doesn't really apply to high school publications sometimes. Uh, trust me, I know that. I remember when I reported on like a, like a teacher or whatever, I had to hand it over to the teacher beforehand. Um, so if you, guys, if you guys have to go through that process, don't worry. Um, it just might be good for you folks to know if you actually decide to pursue news reporting or journalism in university or post-secondary later on. Um, but yes, I have an example. Val can go to the next slide. Yes, okay, so I was reaching out to this man via email. Um, I guess I also didn't mention the subject line. So you always kind of want to market media inquiry. Um, sometimes I'll put like media inquiry, the eye opener, which is the publication I work for or the school, or I'll even maybe just put like a short slug. So maybe like three or four words about like what the article is about and what I'm trying to reach them out for. Um, so very simple. I just sent him an email. I quickly identified myself. I told him what the story was about. Um, this was when, uh, yes, <laughs> this is like the one year when uh, cannabis was legalized in Canada and I was trying to find an expert that could speak upon it. Um, so yes, I briefly told him what the story was about, briefly outlined what I was hoping to discuss with him. Um, I noted that I wanted to talk over the phone and I also noted my deadline. Um, it's also just super nice to add a couple of like exclamation points sometimes so you come up friendly and not just always like um, the scary journalist who is burdening them with all these questions. Um, but yeah, just to, that's, I think that's all for my reaching out to source via email. Um, let me know if you guys have questions. I hope I didn't go too fast. I will pay attention to the chat when Val's talking, but I hope that makes sense. All right, the interview. I will not go too, too much in depth with this um, because there is a session, I think next week or upcoming about interviewing and you'll hear from more amazing reporters who've been doing this way longer than I have. Um, so interviews can be kind of scary. Like, you know what you're gonna do. Um, you know who you're gonna talk to, but then you're like, oh, I actually have to talk to them, which I understand how scary it is. I remember our second class in journalism school which was like four, oh my God, four years ago for me. Um, second day, they're like, okay, go interview random people on the street. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so it can definitely be really scary. So my first tip, which is easier said than done, don't be afraid. No one's gonna like come to your house and find you and like be mean to you on the internet. Like, it's okay. Um, you're just there to ask them questions and they understand that and you want to know stuff. So of course you're going to ask them questions and you might stumble over your words, but you're just trying to learn because at the end, when you're doing the interview, you're trying to learn and understand the information being given to you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my first tip going in. Just breathe. You're going to be okay. And nine out of 10 times, usually they're just so nice. So don't even worry about it. Um, record your interviews. It is blows my mind how much people don't do this, but it didn't click in my head that people don't think to do it. Um, like Maddie said, please let them know that they are being recorded. And again, it's not like you're gonna post their recording to SoundCloud after it's done and be like, everyone listen to this. Like, it's just for your own notes. It's just for fact checking purposes. Keep all your receipts because you never know if it can come up later. I doubt in your case it really would, but just for the general rule of thumb, you never know, like later on, someone could say, well, I didn't say that. And you could pull it up being, well, you know, Susan, yes, you did. <laughs> um, and when you're starting the interview, make sure to ask for their full name, their, uh, their title, their pronouns, let them know, you know, the, the call is being recorded and when the article around will be published. Sorry, I'm just going to go over my notes very quickly. Um, yeah, so I have kind of a general script when I first started out. I actually wrote out what I was going to say almost verbatim because I was so nervous. Um, so a general thing that I do is, hey, um, I kind of explain what the story is and what I need them to kind of talk about or what I need them to kind of explain as a bit of an introduction. Um, 
I'll let them know. Just to let you know, this is being recorded. Um, it won't be posted anywhere, but it is just for my notes and for my editor's fact checking purposes. And I usually say, so before I get into it, before we start, can I get your name, the title you want to be referred to, and your pronouns? Get that out of the way in the beginning, because then you're going to forget by the end. So get that out of the way in the beginning. Um, and it kind of lets the interview go a bit more smoothly, in my opinion, because I find sometimes jumping into the questions is very jarring for them. Um, so just kind of feeling it out a little bit can really help you gain more confidence talking to them. Um, and, you know, you know how to do the interview now, you, you're ready, but now you're like, okay, I have to write the questions. <laughs> and I think a question a lot of people will ask themselves is, okay, but what makes a good question? And we've all heard the term, like, there is no stupid questions, because there isn't. Trust me, especially when you're trying to learn something, like Maddie said, there are no dumb questions. I remember I wrote a story, I was covering um, a forensic audit, which is an audit when they go over your finances, um, to see if they can criminally charge you with something. Um, and I was doing it on the student union because of the year ago, actually it wasn't a year ago when I did it. A few months ago, our paper broke that the student union was mishandling funds via credit card and they were doing an audit and I talked to a prof and I fully did not get what he was saying. <laughs> and I was like, you need to kind of explain this to me. And he was great. He um, like honestly taught me like I was a student and, and it was really awesome and I just, ask questions. Okay, what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, don't be afraid to kind of interject or like, you know, have them elaborate on something if you don't understand. Um, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about questions very briefly. These are Maddie's questions that I think, um, was this from your last story, Maddie, or was this from a different one? Uh, this is from a story I just did. <laughs> Um, so I was reporting on this community in Nova Scotia called North Preston. Um, it's a historic black community and we really just wanted to highlight a couple of issues that these folks have been facing. Um, and we really wanted to kind of like amplify and, you know, actually find out like what this town is about. So I reached out to this one gentleman, super sweet. Um, I talked to him on the phone. Um, so I didn't send him these questions, these are just like I laid it out for you folks to see. Um, but yeah, especially when you're talking to someone you don't know, sometimes when you ask questions, it can be um, a little awkward and like you don't, you definitely don't want to come up on the wrong foot. Um, and you don't want to come off as the journalist who's just like boom, 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 question, question, question. Um, so some of my tips below are think about what your story is. What do you want to address? What do you want to include? research whoever it is beforehand um even if it's like a quick google search you're looking on their linkedin you're looking on their personal portfolio website you're seeing what kind of work they've done um just kind of know who they are before you go in um and by that you can kind of form the questions beforehand and write them out before your interview you definitely don't want to work on the spot um it's much easier when you have some questions to at least refer to um, I personally kind of like to do my interviews in a more um, open discussion format where it kind of feels more like a conversation rather than me like always <laughs> just asking questions. Um, it also just helps folks feel much more comfortable, especially because journalists and journalism can be very scary <laughs> sometimes. Um, but yeah, so I want to talk about some open ended questions, um, including kind of like the five W's. So emphasize and I guess like go beyond like a simple yes or no and surface level question. You could ask, um, for example, you know, like, what is it like being XXX? What is, how does your organization work towards whatever goals they may have? Um, can you give me examples of how you folks are working towards those goals? Um, if you're interviewing just like a local um, resident or whatever, and you just want to know more about them, maybe stuff like who do you look up to as a mentor and why? Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. Like you want to kind of like leave it open so they have the space um, to just kind of discuss whatever comes to mind without them being so confined and feeling like they have to answer one way or another. Um, I find this is super, it's just, it's just way more useful, to, useful like especially like making a connection and bond with the person and just trying to get as much information as possible. Um, but yeah, these are some of the questions that I asked this gentleman. 
Um, I also had to send them <laughs> to my prof beforehand just so she could just make sure we were asking the right questions. And see, she said these were excellent questions. So <laughs> um, I guess when you guys get the slides and you have um, any trouble like coming up with questions, you can always refer to this um, and refer to any of my other tips as well. Um, yeah, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, and yeah, when it comes to Zoom interviews, I don't know if you guys are doing that as well. Um, I found it useful just to kind of start with like a light discussion, like introduce yourself, like talk about something that's like not about the story right away. Just because meeting someone over Zoom, as you guys can probably like feel right now, like watching me talk to a screen <laughs> is super weird and super awkward. Um, but yeah, it just it just kind of gives like the space so you can also get comfortable as well. Like I used to get really bad phone anxiety when I would call people and Zoom doesn't make it any better when you're face to face. Um, so yeah, just brief them a bit about yourself, about the story, and um, hopefully, you know, you can always um, ask some more questions like after on or ask them afterwards, like, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, just before we jump into the next thing um, and go over formatting before we get into exercises, I like these questions a lot because you can tell that A, she did her research um, because you can definitely tell there's things that you wouldn't get from just, you know, jumping into an interview, but she's also asking questions because she doesn't know everything about it. There are some things that you can only get from people that are from certain communities or in certain jobs. You can ask them questions based on your research and that makes for a really good interview and they get really impressed by their questions. They're like, oh, I'm really glad that you know that. And then you can be, you can kind of have that little quote for a bit. It's fun. <laughs> um, yeah, we're good. let's go over a formatting really quick before we get into our little fun exercise. Oh, yeah. and, um, Maddie, if you want, to, yeah, bleh, sorry. <laughs> Zoom is weird, guys, but. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Um, so I don't know how you folks are formatting your stories. Um, in high school, I didn't even know, like my, my teacher who was supervising the student paper always referred to a headline as just like, like a title. So when I got into journalism school, I was like, oh, the title. And they were like, no, it's the headline. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, anyway, so just basic elements that you guys are probably gonna use at your student papers is the headline and the lead. So the headline of the story, this is the first thing that any of your readers are gonna see. For this, you want to try and encapsulate as much of the story as possible. Catch the reader's eye. Um, if, if your publication's online, they're scrolling through their phone, you want to make them be like, oh, like, let me check that out. Or, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, if it's in like a physical like paper, you want, to, you want them to stop at the page instead of just flipping through it and seeing like something else is going to catch their eyes. Um, so with the head, I just took an example from um, a story that we recently published at the Eye. And it was about a commuting report um, that found that our university, um, our students face the second longest commute in Toronto, um, which I can definitely attest to. Um, but yeah, so you can see in this headline that the problem is identified. Uh, students are facing, oh, sorry, students at the university, the university that we're writing about, are facing the second longest commute out of like however many other universities there are in our city. Um, and we also attribute it to a study, which is the study suggests part. Um, we identify where it's happening. Um, it's a story about students. And, you know, it just kind of jumps in your face like, oh no. <laughs> um, and for the lead, so this is the first graph of your story um, that gives as much of the five W's as possible. Um, not all of them have to be there, but you kind of want to include as much of the information as possible. And I say that because sometimes a headline and the lead is the only thing a person is going to read. So you want to try and summarize. Yeah, people have like a really bad <laughs> attention span. Um, so if it's, the, if it's the head and the lead is the only thing they're reading, then you better make sure that it's good. So the example that we put here was a recent study suggests virus and students have the second longest commute among post-secondary students. Um, in Toronto, according to this study. So we attributed where this information is from, this student moved to your study. We attributed the what, the Ryerson students, oh sorry, that'd be the who, um, and the what is their commute. Um, and we don't have to really identify like the how and the why yet, but we got like three out of five. So you encapsulate like as much of the story as you can. Um, and yes, next slide, Val. 
Yes. Oh, I love the inverted pyramid. It's burned in the back of my eyeballs. <laughs> I, I hate the inverted pyramid, but we're going to talk about it anyways. <laughs> um, so the inverted pyramid is a structure we were taught in journalism school on news stories and articles in general. My prof always said that it helped us prevent and gear away from writing about um, an event and cured kind of stories that Val mentioned earlier when we were discussing what a news story is. Um, and what I mean by that is just like, you know, rather than just an event happened, we're looking into the information that's most important and digging into the event. So we're going beyond surface level. We're actually finding an angle to the story. We're talking to people about that angle and we're providing um, extra, extra information and any other things that they should know. Um, so you want to include the most important information or key findings or highlight an event in the first few graphs. So that is like the top pink bar that is most important. So just any crucial information that the reader must know. Um, you wanna aim to introduce, introduce a source voice. So any people that you interviewed, at least I guess like in the third or fourth graph, just to provide a voice to back up any information with whatever you just introduced in the most important part of the article. Um, and then you also just wanna make sure you hyperlink and attribute any information that doesn't come from your sources. Um, which I'll show in the next slide, but I hope this format just kind of makes sense. So you want to start with um, the most important thing that's going to catch the person's eye, um, what the story is about, and then the less important stuff would kind of be supporting details, whether that be your source or anything to kind of explain or maybe break down information, like how I did in my science story. Um, and then at the bottom would just be background information if you want to talk about other initiatives that a person is doing or you know, the bigger picture of the issue you're writing on, um, et cetera. It can be anything. Um, and then I'll do an example. So Val. Yeah, so this is an example of the story with the headline and, and graph that I just showed you guys. So in the pink box, you can kind of see where we identified the key findings. So Ryerson students have the largest, sorry, the second largest commute. Boom. Okay, 18,000 people were surveyed. Cool. Students found commuting as a barrier. Boom, those are the issues that were identified. That's the topic of the story. That's what we're focusing on. The green box that I circled around is the supporting source voice that we just mentioned about the inverted pyramid. So this student is talking about her experience that backs up the, um, the barriers of commuting part that we just identified um, in the most important section. So she was talking about how she has faced barriers from commuting um, from the local transit. And yeah, she wasn't able to practice in any campus activities because she just spent all her time commuting. Good. And then the blue is just extra background information like we just talked about. Um, this is just talking about where the study um, came from, the history of it, um, how it came to be. Um, that information is good to include sometimes because it also just backs up the credibility of where the study is from and where the information is from. Um, okay, Val. All right, now we're getting to some exercises. You guys are gonna do a little, little thing yourself. It's not scary, trust me. I was really bad at writing headlines and that kind of thing when I started. I'm still, ask Maddie, she wrote most of my headlines. I cannot write them, but it's good to get a practice in. Um, so now that we know how to write ahead, um, this is actually an email that we got um, as an exercise when we were in first year. I don't know if it's made up, <laughs> I think it is. Um, but yeah, so we'll give you guys about, what time is it? Maybe like three-ish minutes, because we we're, we're running low on time. Um, uh, I'll give you like three-ish minutes to try to um, write a headline about eh, like 12 words. Let's have like, that's, like a, that's like a longer headline, but like 10 to 12 words um, on trying to answer the five W's that we talked before. Just try your best. There's no really wrong answers. Try your best um, and just type them out in the chat and we'll talk about the ones that we like and stuff like that. Yeah, so just, just gonna read it, take in the info. Yeah, just to be clear, um, read the little blurb there. Um, just have something kind of drafted in the chat and then when the three minutes are up, we'll just three, two, one, boom, and then put it in the chat and like we can look and see what you guys came up with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, totally not intimidating. Yeah, I'll give you guys until 7.50. I'll give you guys until 7.50, so. And we'll also provide an answer afterwards, so don't feel intimidated. 
And like I said, I'm not the best headline writer in the world, so don't worry. <laughs> Well, you need to go back to the thing so they can read it. Okay, I see people are sending them in the chat. Um, if folks need more time, take that extra minute. But I guess when I said three, two, one, go, <laughs> we, we didn't do that. But <laughs> you guys can just send it. <laughs> like you can just click go if you had it in draft or something. All right, I see a few coming in. So I'm gonna take a look at a, a few of them. Let's see, where do we start? A lot of you guys actually do have it pretty nail on the head, I'm not gonna lie. Like some of you already got it, like good for you guys. So I'm taking a look at them. Uh, a good one, really simple. Drunk driver causes death of mother and daughter at Lawrence Avenue East. What happened? You kind of answered that. Location is good too. Location is really good. Something I didn't, I didn't mention before. Um, yeah, kind of sums up what happens, who is involved, where it happened. Um, head on collision involving drunk diver kills young, um, young mother and daughter. That's something I would write. That's, that's pretty close to something I would write personally. Um, what else do we got here? Yeah, I was so I want to mention this one. This one actually, oh, sorry, keep going, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you go first. <laughs> I was going to say, I see one that actually would work as um, a very good lead, actually. Uh, serious collision on Lawrence Avenue kills mother and daughter. Tests confirm mother was legally drunk at the time. Um, so that one's actually a pretty decent, like, leader nut graph, like, kind of a couple sentences, because you wouldn't put the, some of that in the head, but that is important information you would put right under it. So good catch, making sure that was uh, noted. Yeah, a lot of these definitely identify like the, like the sum of what happened. Um, I would also say, so this is obviously a news release. 
Um, you guys probably won't do this um, in high school, but if it does come about, news releases are usually, or sorry, police releases are usually very short. Sometimes this is the only information that you're going to get. So even though that we like um, summed up like <laughs> all of this at once, um, in the event that this would be the only information you had, you could even do something even simpler, like just the head being something like two pedestrians killed after a car collision in this area. And then in your lead, you could go into the specifics. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope that makes sense. But no, a lot of these are good. And we identified all that we needed. Um, Val, do you have any other comments? No, it's good that you guys got this this pretty pretty fast. Like like I said, the one that's head on collision involving drunk uh, drunk driver kills young mother and daughter. Well, the only thing is though is um the one thing I will know is I didn't catch this before I read it again. Um, make sure that you catch this. Um, it doesn't actually identify that Rosemary was driving. It just says that she was killed and she was drunk at the time. Um, so make sure to catch that as well because it doesn't say that the driver Anthony was um oh second car sorry it's been a long day guys <laughs> um sorry but yes um make sure to look out especially like me you made that mistake just make sure you're looking at it but yeah a lot of these hit the nail on the head they're very easy quick that's what you want to get immediately and read a headline so yeah I think a lot of you guys did a great job better better than what I did when I first wrote a headline so that you can take with you all right this next exercise is really fun. Um, so this is a bit of an audio exercise. We're gonna practice pulling quotes a bit. Um, that's a super important part when you're writing a story um, is making sure that you're pulling relevant and interesting quotes um, when you're reporting on something. So this is done, um, this is actually a piece of audio we were also again sent first year um, from our very lovely prof who set this up to make it sound amazing. Um, and yeah, um, uh, we also have on the next slide, just in case for accessibility purposes, it will be transcribed on the next slide. But yeah, um, we're just gonna have you guys see, pull some quotes and um, maybe like one or two and see what you think is the most relevant. Um, please let me know if you can hear this because it, I really hope it works. <laughs> if not, I might ask Laura to play it. But uh, yeah, enjoy this very well-produced fake press conference. <laughs> People of Gotham City, like many of you, I was shocked and pained to hear of the untimely deaths of Thomas and Martha Wayne. I'd known Thomas and Martha for decades, and they were good friends to me. They were good friends to so many in this city. They were such generous people, both with their time and their resources and their optimistic spirits. And Gotham has tragically lost two more innocent citizens to the senseless crime and violence plaguing our city. Well, I promise to you, people of Gotham, this will not stand. We have been fighting to rid our city of gun violence, and I vow we will continue this battle. And to Thomas and Martha's son, Bruce, Bruce, I promise you that your parents will not have died in vain. Thank you. All right, so that was it. Very, very well done by my prof. Um, so there it is on the screen. Um, I hope you guys can see it. I hope I'm not blocking it too much with like chat and stuff. But let's exit it. Um, there it is on the screen. If you're able to see it, um, transcribed in in full, just in case you uh, need it. Um, yeah, there should be a little poll up um, that you can vote on what quotes you think are the most important. We'll give you like, we got like another three minutes to do it. Yeah. Or Laura will tell us, because I think once everyone submits, then you can see the results. Yeah, I'll launch the poll once yeah. we've had most people respond. Thank you, Isabel.
eat. So I'm gonna wait for about 15 seconds and then I'm gonna launch these results. All right, here we go. Ooh, okay. So the second one, which is Gotham has tragically lost two more innocent citizens to the senseless crime and violence plaguing our city. Got the most votes. Uh, <laughs> none of you chose Bruce. I promise that your parents will not have died in vain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The second one, which is what 56% of you folks voted, is probably the one that I would have used. Um, but to be honest, these quotes could be used throughout a s whole story. Um, but definitely the second one is one that I would put at the top, especially if you were just identifying the lead, what happened, and then boom, the mayor of quote unquote Gotham City said this. Yeah. Y'all don't care about little Bruce. So that's why he became Batman. <laughs> that's why you did it. Now. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say the same. Definitely um, the one that people would say 56%. Not only is it um, a very strong quote, it's a very telling quote. Um, it's one that also like, like, you know, draws people's in. Just the way like senseless and violence, like those strong kind of words and the way that it's said really actually do come through in a story. So that's a really good one. I would also use, we've been fighting to rid our city of gun violence, we'll continue to do this battle. Because when my, my thought when doing this was, um, if you're writing a story, this one would probably be a bit further down because you can give context of um, Commissioner Gordon or Mayor of Gotham um, was doing X, X, and X, Y, and Z at this time to get rid of gun violence. Like it'd be a good context quote if you're gonna add stuff under it. Um, yeah, great. You guys caught it almost immediately, which is great. But like she's like Maddie said, you can use these throughout a story. You could paraphrase a lot of these. Like you could always say, um, you know, when you're kind of leading into a quote, Commissioner Gordon said he knew um, Thomas and Martha for decades and that they were great people. Like you can, this, this can all be used throughout, um, but it's your job to pick which ones are the most quotable and the ones that should be quoted verbatim inside of a story. But yeah, you guys pretty much got it. <laughs> Nail on the head. Yeah, sorry if that, sorry if the audio was very strange. You can imagine once we heard it, we were like, wait, this is Batman. Um, but I hope that was like kind of fun. Um, I think the next slide, oh yes, we're at eight o'clock. So we're at the hour mark. If anyone has any questions for us, if you want like advice as a student journalist, um, if you care, <laughs> if you care to ask these, these <laughs> Two girls that are like however many years older than you guys. Um, our, our social media handles and like our emails are also there as well if you guys need advice in the future. Um, I've had a lot of like younger journalists even reach out to me and like say like hey can you look over like this application or whatever or do you have advice for specifically like being a racialized journalist etc. So if you guys need anything like Val and I are definitely like down to answer any other questions. Um, but yeah, if there's questions like in the chat, I know it's hard to like encapsulate like what news reporting is in one hour. So there's definitely more to learn. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Or I think there's like a raise hand option on Zoom, but I feel like only Laura can see it. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can see it. Not 100% sure about that. Hey, so we've got a question here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, um, Melody Ray asked, uh, can you speak about journalism ethics for a sec? Hmm, that's a good question. Oh, uh, big topic. That's, a, that's a great question. Do you have big any specific we questions? You... Whole... Oh, sorry, Valerie. I was just wondering, Melody, sorry. do you have any specific no, no, no. topics of journalism ethics you want to, you have questions about? Yeah, so it, it, journalism ethics is a, is a big kind of broad topic. There's, 
obviously a ton of ethics that come into reporting and we've definitely run into some at the eye opener and even in my own like freelance work um we actually have had not one but two classes on ethics um in our time at journalism school um i would say i think as a journalist something you should think about is um I, I think one thing that i needed to be taught on is how to turn off my journalist brain how to turn on my human brain um and to be more of a person because i think that sometimes with journalists we become so methodical in the way that we do things and you know we're such people who want to tell the truth and we're such truth tellers and we want to make sure people are informed and people are held accountable but you also have to remember that these people are people and we, we get so i think bogged down by that kind of information we kind of forget how it might affect people's lives so i think just being a human is something that people actually won't tell you is um learn to be a human um and it's very hard if you're like me i have a very hard time separating myself from my job um which is bad don't make your job your life <laughs> um but i would say just being honest is just something that's important being honest to yourself and your source um being very very black and white with what you're kind of looking for them um like through them um yeah ethics is kind of a difficult question um i can always again answer things on twitter if you have more specific things but um, Maddie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would say like, like of course, like for journalists, like our job is to produce like informative and credible reporting. Um, but like Val said, I think it's also important to be empathetic and very mindful of how you come across, how you're interacting with different folks, um, how you present them, especially when you're reporting on racialized and marginalized communities. That is a huge one. Um, I guess, like, when I, when I, when I saw the question about, like, ethics, like, I guess, like, we can talk about, like, objectivity for, like, a hot second, because I feel like that also kind of goes into ethics, like, right, Val? Objectivity is a kind of a tricky one, because I think at the beginning, especially with R, I don't know if you would say this, Maddie, I feel like in at least the space that I have read on, like, Twitter and like, what we learned, the concept of objectivity is important, but it's almost kind of being questioned a little bit um, in a sense that when you go into school or when you go into journalism, they tell you have to be objective. Um, you have to be able to look at things um, from all sides and you have to be able to look at things at a very neutral point of view to get the truth. Um, but at the same time, they'll tell people who are part of a racialized group, you can't report on your own community because you're too close to it. And that's a little bit where it's become a hard and fast line of like, what does it mean to be objective? Um, what is objectivity? I think we're still, that's a question that I think I'm also still kind of asking myself, like what is objectivity? But I think there is a level of truth to it. Like recognizing your own personal bias is a big thing that comes into writing stories and reporting and being able to not push away your bias, but understand how it's going to play in to the way you report and you interview and you carry about doing journalism is something that's really, really important to recognize early on. But it's also important to recognize that, the con to me, the concept of objectivity is being put into question a lot just because I don't think anyone could be fully, fully objective. Um, and I think that's something a lot of journalists need to reconcile with in our, at least what I've seen. Um, but being able to kind of report something and look at it from all sides as much as possible in where it is needed, that's important too, because sometimes you'll get into situations where maybe the other side of it, maybe their part isn't important. That's a bit of a different situation, but I think being able to tell what parts of the story need to be told in what kind of way and being able to look at yourself and say, okay, what are my own personal biases? What are my own things that I realize that's going to affect the way that this is done? I hope that makes sense. It's a bit complicated because it's a bit of a complicated topic. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that made sense. <laughs> it's, it's a question that is a big question for me and something that I've been really thinking about since I left school. But um, yeah, it, do you have anything to add for that, Maddie? I know it's a very big and long explanation, but... <laughs> I feel like you like you you explained it pretty well um there's definitely like a lot of layers to it and I know you folks are in high school so there's definitely still things um that you're gonna like encounter like for sure I feel like 
for people like like Val and I like we just we're I'm in my fourth year she just got out of um out of university like we're kind of in the position where we're kind of questioning some of the things we were taught in journalism school and objectivity is definitely one of it um but yeah there's definitely a lot of layers to that if anyone wants to talk about that you can hit one of us up and I will gladly go on about it <laughs> um but for the sake of time yeah <laughs> I see, is there any opportunities to recommend? So when I was in high school, I did my student paper. I also worked for a community paper. So um, like I lived in like, like a small like suburb in Toronto called Scarborough. So there was like all these community papers that would sometimes take stories from high school journalists. So maybe you guys can look into that. One of my friends also wrote for like a community centered newsletter. So just like weekly beats of like whatever was happening in the community so like the top events like maybe a profile of someone from the community um that could be something you might want to look at, into um there's also just like certain jobs that um I forget where it is I can like link it maybe afterwards but there's certain ones that like can pay you to transcribe audio if that's something you guys want um there's also what was I going to mention um there was something else and I totally forgot. Um, I, I also kind of pitched things to, what was the first thing I wrote for outside? So the first magazine that I wrote for that was like non-student paper was called Shameless Magazine. I believe it's based in Canada. Um, but there's honestly certain magazines and certain outlets. And all I did was send them an email like, hey, I'm really interested in writing. Like, is there a writer's list or volunteer list that I can be put onto? for any future opportunities and like a couple months later I was in my first year and they were actually like hey yeah like there's a whole bunch of stories like email this editor um and like any pitch that you're interested in writing about and that's what I did and I ended up profiling um the super cool like indigenous leader I wrote about um I don't know like just like advice things like setting your own time from school things like that um, and if you go into um, university, post-secondary, um, things I've done, I've worked for like, like, like university media organizations, if that makes sense. Like, you know, those student pages or like your student unions that man like social media and like all those different sites. Like there's so many opportunities. Um, it doesn't just have to be writing. It can also just be handling social media. It can be copy editing. It can be taking photos, newsletters, like so on and so forth. Like the good thing about journalism is that like it is so versatile in the sense where it's like you don't have to just be pulled into just reporting. Um, like you can do so many different things. So I hope that helps. Val can also add anything. Yeah, so I had, like I said before, I had no high school paper. I remember I attempted to start one in my uh, final year and they told me no. So <laughs> I hope every of you who don't have it are more successful than I am and try to start a paper but um yeah I mean I didn't really I'll be honest with you uh, when I went to journalism school I wasn't even sure if that's what I wanted to do forever um because I was just I was leaving high school and I knew that I if I didn't go to university I would just never go <laughs> um I mean I would say I think a good thing to do is something we do at the eye opener at least I'm not sure how the schools do it but I'm not sure if any schools in the States or even some schools in Canada have um, co-op placements or internship things. We had like little high school interns in our newsroom. And if you can somehow intern at like a campus, like a college paper near you, it is a really, really good experience. And editors are always so nice. We like, at least in my experience, I loved having the high school students there. It was always so fun to talk to them. I felt quite old sometimes because it's going to be someone like grade nine, I would be in like, I was uh, in fourth year at the time, and I was like, oh, I feel 100 years old. <laughs> but um, uh, try to be, if there's any kind of opportunities to that at your school, or, you know, that's something I did. I've been writing for my whole life, and when I applied to journalism school, I know not all of you will, but just using a general example, I didn't really have any bylines. I had none. So I had to write my entire thing from scratch, and I slaved over it for two and a half months. I did not sleep don't recommend that, please sleep. Um, but I slaved over for two months and I ended up getting in. Um, and honestly, sometimes just practicing on your own without publishing it is a great thing. Like one thing that I did was kind of an experiment and I was decided, cause I'm a person who wears a lot of makeup and 
I decided to do a bit of a study as an, uh, as an article of how people would treat me differently, how I would feel differently if I wore a full glam face of makeup to school every day for a week and I didn't wear makeup for a week and see how different people would treat me um, and just to see how I felt personally. Um, and I didn't publish that. I just wrote that just because I was curious and I wrote like a news story and that's what I used my portfolio. So even just writing on your own and just like practicing is a really great thing. And like Maddie said, just trying to get involved in the community is a really good idea. Um, yeah, or even, um, oh, I just want to turn that thought there. Uh, even a blog, start a blog early. <laughs> start posting stuff on your blog. You don't need to have a lot of followers. Just, it, it gets you in the, you know, the mindset of things being public on the internet and being able to self-publish yourself a little bit is a really good thing if you don't have any kind of school papers or any of those avenues around you, because I know I didn't really have those. Um, just kind of self-motivating yourself to do it um, is a really great thing to start on, especially if you're still in high school. Yep, okay. Uh... Yay, we love Toronto people. Uh, okay, did folks have like any other questions, pieces of advice? I know it's also 8.13, so you can feel free to like DMs questions. Like I'm down to send emails back or whatever. Um, also, just plug now that our next session is going to be on interviewing. So if you enjoyed this and want to learn more about interviewing, which of course is such a big part of the news reporting process, Laura just posted the link to that sign up form in the chat. So we hope to see a lot of you there. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. okay. And I would, I would also say to anyone who is on the here now and isn't currently signed up for 